Hey everyone, Mark from RoboFlow here. Um, so I, today I'm going to walk through um, a blog, oh, the notebook of a blog that I just released uh, on synthetic data generation using uh, stable diffusion, okay? So um, like I said, I'm going to uh, walk through, I won't go through the entire blog, um, it's here. Uh, I'll share this link uh, in the video um, where you can get a little bit more detail and exactly, you know, kind of my, my process throughout. Um, but, um, you know, I'll just talk through it here um, and we'll go through the notebook a little bit um, just to get a feel for it. Um, so, you know, what we what I use here is stable diffusion, right? So stable diffusion is everywhere right now. Uh, one of the hottest uh, AI models in the world. Um, so let's do this. What is stable diffusion? Let's let's get a let's get a, a definition. OK, so Stable Diffusion is a deep learning text to image model released in 2022. It was actually released in August. Um, so text to image model, what does that mean? It means you essentially input text and output is uh, is an image. Um, so that's primarily what it does, but it actually does more, right? So it can also be used for in painting, uh, out painting, uh, and generating image to image, right? So image to image, meaning like you could put an image in and it'll spit out a variation of that same image. Um, or in painting, uh, meaning you can have some kind of, um, you know, object uh, put into an image. Um, you know, you can create a mask from within the image. Um, say you wanted to add um, a bicycle to an image that is just the road. Um, you have the ability to do that too. So it's extremely powerful <clears throat> and uh, really, really hot right now, right? And, um, you know, I think stable diffusion being kind of all the rave right now, but, you know, it's, it's based on, well, it's not based on, it is, you know, one of the more popular ones uh, from the past, from previous to stable diffusion was DALI 2, right? So um, DALI 2 coincidentally just went into uh, public beta, um, probably because stable diffusion uh, is kind of taking over the world. So, um, you know, you now have the ability to use DALI 2 um, with, uh, you know, public beta, meaning you can just hit their API. So, um, you know, what is DALI 2? If you didn't know what that is, that's an open that was released by OpenAI. It's a new AI system that creates the same thing: realistic images and art from a description, right? So it's it's using the natural language and creating an image, right? So, um, as I mentioned, DALI 2 is now available as an open uh, as an API. Um, now you have to pay for DALI 2, right? Um, so um, I guess the uh, the trade off is you know you don't have to train anything, you don't need any GPU, um, you could just hit the uh, API for DALI 2. Uh, you know, with a prompt and it'll spit back an image um, or, you know, but you do have to pay, I think it's about five cents per image actually. Um, and so, you know, obviously as, as you can imagine, that would get extremely expensive if you're doing thousands and thousands of thousands and thousands of images. Um, or you can go with stable diffusion, get a little bit more hands-on um, and you could, uh, you know, uh, train that model uh, and generate a prompt based on that. Right. So um, I'll get back to the blog here. So I think the power in this really and I mean, let me just say, first off, you know, a lot of things are out there, a lot of resources out there for, for using stable diffusion to generate images, right? But a lot of them are kind of play, right? Fun, kind of play AI, right? So you're giving it some wild text, you know, a unicorn wearing a cape, you know, flying over a rainbow at, you know, at, at dusk. Um, and it generates fantastic images. But the point I wanted to make was that you can actually use stable diffusion to generate images for your real life business use case your real life business computer vision use case um, and it can help uh, tremendously with the you know the main problem i see out there and i talk to customers all the time about it is the lack of representative data right and and the key is representative right so um, i use a, an example in this blog actually that's you know representative data is extremely hard to find right so uh, I put an example here that, you know, you, you, you may find it easy. So say you wanted to identify a specific tree species from an aerial view, um, getting image data from an aerial view that may include that species, but would include many other things, maybe easy enough, right? You can maybe source that somewhere, but getting representative data of just that species of tree from an aerial view can be very challenging, right? So this is where stable diffusion and the, the power comes in, right? You have the ability to tell it aerial view of, you know, X species of tree and, you know, run that through and, and you'll get, you know, AI generated images that are of exactly representative what you want it to be. Um, so very powerful stuff. So first, like I said, I'll, I'll walk through um, the notebook a bit here. So here's the notebook here. 
in my blog, I actually run it on SageMaker Studio Lab, which is uh, AWS's uh, version of you know free Jupyter uh, notebooks hosted Jupyter. Um, it's kind of their com competitor to Google Colab. Um, but you know, for this one, I'm going to actually use Google Colab for the video. Um, and you know, you can use that script anywhere that you can run Jupyter. Um, try to you know, preferably with a GPU. Uh, it requires a, a GPU, or you'll be there for for days. So uh, please pick something that has a GPU when you run this notebook. But you can. You can run this notebook anywhere you want. And it's actually very, very simple. It's a very simple script. So um, I've already ran it. We'll just kind of talk through a little bit of, of what we're doing here. So in the first cell, um, I just import my libraries. Um, as you can see, I'm, I'm bringing in Hugging Face um, and the Transformers library because we are going to pull the stable diffusion model, uh, the runway ML stable diffusion model from the Hugging Face hub. Um, and then we're obviously going to import RoboFlow because uh, what we're, our goal is here is to generate, you know, your AI images, and then you're going to pump them back up to your RoboFlow project, um, and then further enrich your training data set, and then train a model from within RoboFlow, right? So it's kind of that full end-to-end -end, um, uh, of, uh, you know, computer vision lifecycle. So after we import our libraries, um, we then do a uh, login to the Hugging Face Hub. You have to authenticate with the Hugging Face Hub. So um, I'll show you here how you can get your key. So I'm in Hugging Face. Uh, I go to Settings, and then I go to Access Tokens, and here is my Access Token. So you can copy this, and you bring it right over here. Once you run this cell, you'll actually get a Hugging Face pop-up that'll uh, allow you to input your key. Copy that in. You'll get a successful login. Uh, it's also worth mentioning before I forget that at this point as well, so once you, uh, you know, grab, you go to, we're grabbing the 1.5 stable diffusion model. So it's the latest stable diffusion model from the Hugging Face Hub. You actually have to agree to the terms and conditions as well um, of the model. So you have to go to the model itself uh, in Hugging Face. And I've already done it, so it's not here, but you'll have to click, you know, I agree to the terms and conditions. Then you'll be able to pull it into your notebook. So you, you will not be able to pull that in, that model into your notebook until you accept the terms and conditions. All right. So after we connect to Hugging Face, we've uh, you know agreed to the terms and conditions on the model. Then we uh, we bring in the uh, the model itself, right? So we're we're going to create a pipeline uh, based on the Stable Diffusion Pipeline uh, class. Um, we're grabbing the Runway ML uh, Stable Diffusion model 1.5 is the latest version, um, and then we're uh, going to uh, make sure it runs on uh, GPU. Okay, like I said, you're going to want to run this on GPU. So you bring everything in accordingly. There you go. And then on your next cell here, it's a very simple kind of cell, right? So all we're doing is we're, we're creating the generate images function. Um, it's going to take the prompt that you want to input to define your image. Um, you're going to give it the number of images to generate. Um, so this is the total number of images. You, then you're going to give it the number of images to generate per prompt. Um, so we're iterating through. So we're going to do four images, then iterate through, do another four, do another four. That's what we have it set for. Okay, and this all depends on the GPU, your GPU that you're using. Um, then we have guidance scale set for eight. So what is guidance scale? Uh, guidance guidance scale is the amount of ability you want to give to your model to allow it to. Uh, design the image. So think of it as the freedom scale for your model. How much freedom do you want to give the AI model to create this image based on your prompt? So the higher the uh, guidance scale, the less freedom you're giving it. The lower, the more freedom you're giving it. So um, you could go four, is which I what I have it set for. You could, or sorry, eight. You could go four, which gives the model more freedom, or you could go higher to give it less freedom. And I, I strongly encourage you to play with the uh, the guidance scale to see what the output is. It's actually really cool to see when you start running them. Um, then we're gonna output all the images we create into an images directory um, and we're saying false for uh, displaying the images in browser as you run or in notebook sorry and then as i said we just iterate we just iterate through every batch of four we iterate through and and then you also have the ability to define some of the image sizes uh, size uh here in the width and height um, i'm just going to keep it 128 to 128 here for this but you could set it to to what you'd like for your uh use case and then next cell, we just generate image. We call the generate images function, right? Uh, the prompt that I'm using is human on a forklift. So the reason I chose this is actually a very simple prompt, nothing extravagant, nothing crazy, is because this is a real life use case, right? People need to identify, you know, safety hazards in a plant or in a warehouse, in manufacturing. 
Um, and let's let's use a forklift as an, as an example, right? So they want to know where the forklifts are, are. They want to know if the forklift is manned. Um, they want to know if it's empty, things like that, right? So I'm just thinking of like a really common safety use case um, that isn't, you know, very difficult to define in a prompt as well, right? Um, I'm actually going to, you know, define the batch of four here, which is already defined up there, so I don't really have to. Uh, I am going to tweak the guidance scale. I am going to put it as a four, so I'm going to give the model a little bit more power to define what those images are. And I will display the images here. I'm overriding the false just so you could see them, okay? So here I just did four images just to quickly show. As you can see, here's my four images that were created. You can see the thumbnail, um, and they're also created in, um, they're created in, in, it's not here right now because this timed out, but this would be, they would be in an images directory in here. It would create an images directory in your Google Collab in the main content location, and your images would be stored in there. So as you can see, you know, pretty great images that were generated. I will say the humans tend to be a little bit distorted. Um, now that is okay for this use case. If you're trying to generate humans, you might want to kind of tweak the way you, you kind of input that prompt. For me, it was just a matter of knowing if it was manned in the forklift or not manned. So um, it was perfectly fine for my use case. And as you can imagine, you know, you have the ability to easily, you know, put a bounding box around this forklift, put a bounding box around the human um, and define those two classes accordingly. <clears throat> so from there, you've generated your images. Let's say you did 2000, 5000, whatever you wanted to do, depending on your GPU size could take a while. I did a thousand originally. It took just over two hours on a SageMaker Studio Lab instance, and that's running a G4 instance type, an AWS G4 instance type. I believe a G4 is an A10, so it's a smaller GPU, and it took, a, two, say, two and a half hours to do a thousand images. So literally run this command, walk away, come back, okay? So from here, what we want to do is we simply want to, we go to the next part where we want to pump them up to our RoboFlow project. Okay, so as you can see here, we're just doing a little bit of path uh, uh, instantiation. Um, we're just letting setting our image directory as uh, the path plus the images uh, location, right? As you can see, that's our image directory, content images. That's where the images will be stored after you run that cell. As I said, mine is now timed out, so it's gone. Good old uh, Google Colab. Another great thing about SageMaker Studio, it has persistent storage. So you do this and then you go away for a week, two weeks, you come back, your images are still there, persistent storage. And you do not get that with Collab, and I'm actually a Collab Pro user, so you still don't get it. Anyways, so then here we're simply going to uh, pull in RoboFlow. Um, you know, we're going to, from RoboFlow, we're going to import RoboFlow, our PIP package. Uh, we're going to pull in some other uh, things like Glob just to properly iterate through all the images. And as you can see, we just set our image directory and then we point it to the images. We define that it's a PNG file, okay? Then we bring in the, the PRIP params. So I'm defining my API key from within RoboFlow. Uh, I, will, uh, I will get rid of this key after this video. This is just to showcase you all what it is. So don't try to use my API key, it will be gone. Um, but you get your RoboFlow API key. I can show you that as well. Uh, let's see here. I go into settings, I'm in my RoboFlow account, and then I go into, where am I here? Uh, settings. So I'm just gonna put this, go into my workspace, and then go into API key. And as you can see, it's the private key. I can copy it here, bring it over into my notebook, as you can see, um, and then my project name. Right, so this is just the name of the project. I created a project just for this uh, this uh, demo video. So stable diffusion testing, and then all I do is I define my my uh, image glob. Right, so I just use glob, which then you know iterates through uh, the image directory and the file extension type. It's very simple stuff, right? And then I perform the upload. Right, so goes through each image and image glob, and it uploads them. Upload project upload into my RoboFlow project. Um, I do a little print statement here just so you can see as they process, processing image. Um, this is the total number of images here and then the image name, right? So as you can see, I just pump all four of them up. I mean, it took me to push these up to RoboFlow. It's a lot faster um, than doing anything of the generation side, right? So I, when I pushed a thousand images up, I think it took like, I don't know, five minutes. So the four images took me about three seconds. So, and then I push them up to my RoboFlow project. And then if I go into my RoboFlow project, here it is, and if you go into annotate, 
all the images come into here. So they come into your unassigned tab, okay? And then you have the ability to then click on them. Remember, let's say I want to assign them to myself. And now you can begin annotating and labeling your images. So let's go and do one here, okay? Forklift, okay, there you go, forklift. Let's do human as well. As you can see, I don't know if you can see in the video, but the human's a little distorted. It looks kind of like a mannequin. Um, but it'll get the job done for this use case. Same thing here. You see that human, and then let's say forklift. There you go. Okay, so that's it. That's uh, It's that easy. Um, so now, as I said, easily generating images, representative images for your real-life business use case computer vision project, pumping them, in, uh, the, pumping them up into your RoboFlow project, um, and then further enriching your, your data set to then build a, a sweet you know, computer vision model, right? And, uh, the more data, the more representative data, the better, right? The better your model will be. Um, and it's worth mentioning, I'll go back to the notebook here. I've, I put in here some further enhancements that I'd like to do to this notebook. Like this is very simple. It, it, it is good for, in my opinion, it's good to, uh, to generate your images and then pump them into your RoboFlow project. Um, but you then have to annotate and label them. So what I'm doing is I'm showcasing how you can take it a little bit further, a little bit more power in this, right? So what you would do, say you had a, a, a use case like the forklift one that is already in RoboFlow Universe, okay? So what is RoboFlow Universe? RoboFlow Universe is the largest collection uh, in the world today of open source computer vision data sets, APIs, and models, okay? So over 100 million images, over 110,000 data sets, and over 10,000 pre-trained models. I think we're over 13,000 pre-trained models now, right? So if I wanna look at forklift, does anyone else have a forklift model in here? And if you can see, they do, okay? So let's grab this one, okay? So here's a forklift model that already exists, okay? So what you can do then in this case is I can hit the, I can send all my generated images to that model, right? So I'm gonna hit that model for predictions. You can hit that model all you want. It's a, it's a publicly available model. Um, so you can hit that model, get a prediction, okay? So in the prediction itself, you're gonna have bounding box coordinates, right? So you're gonna have an annotation or a label because of those coordinates, right? So you can actually use that uh, prediction data to further annotate your non-annotated images, if that makes sense, right? So, um, you know, what you have the ability to do now is kind of further automate this process, right? So you could even take the confidence level, right? Set a threshold of 50%. So you're saying, if this open source model predicts a higher confidence than 50% for this image, this forklift, then I think it's a good forklift. So let's take the coordinates and the annotation data that you're getting from the prediction, merge it, and then pump it back into RoboFlow, into your RoboFlow project as both the image and the annotation, right? So that way it kind of just saves you time, right? You don't have to then label any data. You don't have to, you know, hire an annotator. You don't have to get your team to annotate. Just kind of saves you on that, that piece and it takes it one step further and gives it a little bit more power. Um, so really cool stuff. You can keep building on this. I just wanted to showcase a very, very simple uh, way to generate images, uh, representative data for your computer vision project. Um, but lots more you can do. Lots more you can do. Um, and I think it's it's only beginning to touch on the power that you can you can kind of enable in computer vision by using this these kind of text to prompt or text to image uh, models that are just so popular in the world right now. And um, yeah, and I think that's it for me. And uh, I appreciate the time. And I hope you enjoy the video. Thanks, everyone.